Going live in, we are live and recording. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today at the Festival of Enterprise for our first webinar of the day. It's my pleasure to welcome once again, Melissa Snover. Um, how are you doing, Melissa? I'm doing well, thank you, Alex. Nice to see you again, speak to you again. You too, so it'd be good to, um, to have a catch up, find out what you're up to. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us, wherever you are. I can see Julian there, Julian Moore, Business Engagement Manager from the University of Birmingham has already posted up. So um, everybody else, let us know where you are watching from today. If you're watching this, we're now streaming every webinar on social media. So we're on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube all at the same time. So um, if you would like to come and join us over here, then feel free to do so by going to festivalofenterprise.co.uk uh, to jump on this platform. And just to frame uh, this morning's chat, so Melissa's been an entrepreneur since the age of 23 and has built a reputation for being one of the leading, the leading visionaries in the world of food tech and 3D printing. Um, she's currently the founder and CEO of Remedy Group, uh, which pioneers 3D printed personalized health solutions across nutrition and medicine. And the two brands are, I believe I'm right, Melissa, I know nourished, and then you've got scripted as well. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Very good. You got it. <laughs> got it. I got it. I got it. Um, and a bit more information for people, and we'll dive into a little bit more. Um, but you founded um, you first in the in, in like the, the sweet space or candy space, I suppose, with regards to creating the world's first vegan, natural, and um, allergen-free fruit sweet with the brand name Goody Good Stuff. Um, and after selling that, you partnered with the Catchy's family um, to launch Catchy's Magic Candy Factory, which was a confectionery company which allows a consumer to 3D print delicious vegan gummy candy. Um, people will, I'm trying to remember the name now. It's a pig. Remind me, it's a pig. What's the one? Percy. <laughs> I see them everywhere. I see them they everywhere. They are everywhere. Yes, it's Marks yeah. and Spencer brand. Um, That's good. And uh, yes, it's the business, uh, the Catches business is an incredible company, still family owned, um, multiple factories and a humongous appetite for innovation. And they are also the owner of that business is still an investor in my new my new group as well. And a great yes. mentor to me over the last whatever it is, six or seven years that we've known each other. He's a, he's a great man. Yeah, because I think that was when we first spoke to you a couple of months ago, kind of right at the start of uh, lockdown. He gave us some real insights into, I think we were a month in or something. He gave us a great um, presentation on, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, you know, in the different sectors, et cetera. And you'd just come off a successful funding round not that long ago as well. So is that all, all done and dusted now and you're kind of motoring ahead? You said you're recruiting, for example. So maybe, yeah, tell us. What's, what's the last, say, couple of months been like for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the business started trading in November of last year. So when COVID hit, it was really only like four months old. So, you know, that can be a business killer um, for any company, even a really established one. But I think when businesses are younger, um, their risk of failure is higher. I think that's a pretty well established trend. And so, yeah, it could have gone several ways. Now, luckily, the COVID crisis um, did not impede our ability to trade because we're a food business and, and we also are a health business. And so we were 3D printing PPE and making hand sanitizer and working with local councils and care homes. And then of course, still making our nutrition products, which we also donated to the NHS staff um, and sent out from our factory in Birmingham. It was really scary in the beginning. I think a lot of people thought I was overreacting um, when I set up our protocols. Um, we have everything from like infrared cameras that are judging people's temperature variations to, um, of course, full PPE for everyone on site to disclaimers um, and, and so on and so forth. But on the back of that humongous amount of planning and diligence in making sure that it, we stuck to it, no one within the business has gotten sick and we've been able to continue trading the whole way through, which I'm really proud of. Um, mm -hmm for being really taking the responsibility and taking it seriously, really, because one bad apple bringing it into the building would have spoiled the whole thing. And it was really great to see their commitment to that. Now, mm -hmm. on the back of you know COVID-19 hit and of course, um, 
you know, a lot of businesses were negatively hit by no fault of their own, like the hospitality trade and travel amongst many, many others. Right. But with our business um, being a direct to consumer home delivery health product, um, it didn't have a, de a huge detrimental effect on us as individuals, but it mm -hmm. also made it more challenging to hire new people to to make sure our supply chain was robust because there wasn't goods in and out at the same frequency as there was before. And of course, there was a humongous amount of management required to make sure that we stuck to all these rules and kept everybody safe. Mm -hmm. On the back of it though, it's been amazing. The business has done really well. The support for the community has been well received and is continuing and we've grown um, you know, 25, 35 and 50% month on month for the last three months. And so you know, we've basically doubled our capacity of our factory, we're hiring um, I think right now we have 12 jobs on the board across all of the different departments, technology, marketing, production, fulfillment, logistics, administration, customer care. And um, yeah, we've made a lot of investments internally to be able to give the production facility more machinery and better um, automation options so that we can make that more efficient. Um, the marketing team and the commercial team have been completely remote since March 3rd, right? And this is a... Uh something that I think a lot of business owners were like really worry about, like how do I manage my team when they're not in the building? Mm. And I just, I'm really um, so proud of them because they've done a great job. If anything, they are being more productive than they ever have been before. Mm. And the communication is so strong. I have like 17 groups on my WhatsApp and they are all day do, 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 do. And they're probably <laughs> talking more than they even would have done had we yeah. been office still mm -hmm. and so I think as we go forward you know as we come out of this crisis hopefully um you know with the vaccine coming forward um we will be in a new normal and we won't ever really go back to the old way if i'm honest i think any bad situation you have to try and take learnings and positivity out of what happened because you can't change what happened right and mm -hmm. so we can either sit and wallow in what happened and don't get me wrong I, it is absolutely you know, monumentally horrible what happened, but we have to try and take what we can from it and turn it into a positive and learn from it and create a better tomorrow with what we've learned. Yeah, ab absolutely, hundred percent agree with you. Um, so that's that's interesting. That with regards to, I mean, first of all, you know, congratulations on, on coming through uh, so strongly, and like you say, you kind of add those last ninety days up, and you've kind of doubled the the capacity of the business, haven't you? Which is which is amazing, you know, for for a startup. <laughs> Uh, like you said, we only started trading last November. Um, and with regards to the, the staff side of things, uh, and I've, I've had you know similar conversations with, with a number of uh, entrepreneurs, business owners on here. How do you look at things moving forward then with, with regards to recruitment? Do you look at it as you've actually potentially got a bigger talent pool because people can work at home? You're kind of going to embrace that or do you, do you still want everybody to be, you know, five days a week, 40 hours under the same roof? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that this is like the biggest um, mass spread change that we'll see. And it was kind of like COVID forced us into seeing whether we could do it. And then now that we have had to do it, people are learning what is possible, where perhaps they maybe thought was impossible before. Now, I know in our business, we have our own food factory, we have our own R&D lab. And in certain parts of that, you have to physically be there. We have high level machinery. We're producing a product, packing it and sending out. Those people have to be in the building. So those roles will always have to be you know, on-site functionality. But when it comes to other roles like web dev, um, coding, algorithm, software design, marketing, finance, customer care, these actually can be remote, um, you know, at the moment they're hundred percent remote, but in my perfect world future scenario, you know, we're talking about like a 70, 30 split. I still miss the collaborative energy that my team and I have when we're together. And there's something mm -hmm. about drawing on a whiteboard and brainstorming and throwing out ideas that you just can't do on teams. I don't think yeah. in, in the same way, but I also think that, you know, not making people drive an hour and a half in traffic every day, allowing them to have balance and also be able to focus because our office is very loud and very, you know, laughy. And it, it's really nice, but also it is hard to focus if you need to do something quite, yeah. you know, focus driven. And so mm -hmm. I think that in our future scenarios, we are talking about coming into the office, 
two days a week and staying home three days a week, or maybe doing one day a week to start. And we've actually already onboarded since COVID hit, one, two, three, four, five, five people who have started remotely, done all their yeah. training remotely, yeah. and are now totally integrated into the team and have never actually met face to face. That's <laughs> like, oh. Not even me, which is crazy, right? And they're yeah. doing a great job. I think, you know, it takes a lot of time. We do a lot of video calls. We do a lot of catch ups. We do a lot of roundups and communication has to stay strong. But I really think you can hire people from from all over the world now, um, yeah. as long as you guys are all devoted and committed to the same goal. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was chatting to Al Barrett from Grenade, and he was saying, you know, meant to be moving into this purpose built, you know, 150 people building, and he goes, and now I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> what, yeah. should, what should I do? Um, you know, because every again, he said, you know, people have been more productive being at home, and whether that's, you know, a little bit false, obviously, because of the time we've been in, but there's no reason to think that one can sit, continue at a certain certain pace. Yeah. Um, so it's an, an interesting decision for a lot of businesses. And like you say, it's like we've been, you know, kind of forced into this. And for a lot of businesses, um, for the sectors there, and they've kind of jumped forward. You, you think about the health and fitness business and how many have just moved online because that was the only option. And it's yeah. kind of forced them to, you know, move, I don't know, however many years ahead technology-wise. Um, do you think, I mean, it clearly reflecting your business and chatting to guys like Al Barrett from Grenade and, and James McMaster from Huel, who are, you know, again in the you know, health, fitness, wellness, nutrition space, they're all reporting like three, I think they both said 300% they, they were up. Um, yeah. do, you, do you see this continuing? And I know you've got a crystal ball, but given you know, your experience in this field, um, do you just see it continuing that people have spent so much more time, you know, looking at their own individual wellness and from a corporate perspective as well? Yeah, I think um, I think that the 300 percent up is a pretty good number to give for the health and wellness industry overall. Individual brands will be winners and losers. But I totally agree with both of those guys. And I'm also massive fans of both of those um, businesses and mm -hmm. Grenade is in Birmingham as well. So it's like a really cool Birmingham is like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like um, of health and fitness products. So I and Jim Shark actually was from Birmingham as well. So it's really yeah. cool little like epicenter here. Um, but I think, you know, what has happened with COVID is um, first of all, what happened was people felt this exaggerated sense of scarcity, which made them feel like they needed to panic buy things. I was also guilty of it. Um, my partner really made fun of me when I ordered like 17 cases of this certain cereal that the children like. I would be like, hey, I want to be able to get 17. Like a half a pallet of ketchup. No, that's an exaggeration, but you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. A lot of, and I just was, yeah. I was so worried because for such a long time, we have such easy access to things. We're so spoiled in our in our normal setup that when, mm. as soon as it starts to feel like it's slipping away, your instant reaction is, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I need more. So yeah. I think that, that started it off. And then of course, the, not having access to bricks and mold to retail and that whole dynamic changing about how does the customer shop and where do they buy things? So if you're online, that's really going to help you. If you are mostly bricks and mulcher, then you're going to have a, a you know a different effect. Mm -hmm. But overall, as we go forward in, around health and wellness, I just think that already before COVID hit, over half of the UK population take vitamins every day. People are already and were already growing in the numbers of caring about health and wellness, and that's a trend that's been going for a while. But I think that COVID just basically put like diesel fuel on the fire and basically mm -hmm. made people think about it so much more on a daily basis where they are constantly um, self-aware of how their health is going to possibly have an impact in the immediate future on their safety and the safety of those around them. And I think this is something I think about already, but it has really brought it to the forefront. So products that are being offered that give people options to be healthier in a way that's enjoyable, that has authentic science behind it, have a right to grow. And I think that will continue. And uh, did you see that similar growth um, with your business, like chatting to those two businesses before and, and a number of others, like Gray's was another one that I, that I chatted to, and they were saying people were bringing their orders forward yeah. um, that they were, and, and they were like literally doubling down and tripling down on the size of the orders because they just didn't know when they'd be able to get their hands on that kind of stuff. 
that happened to us too. So we had a lot of our customers pre-ordering three and six months of product at once mm -hmm. um, because of, for that reason, they were just worried like, what if it runs out? What if your supply chain runs out? And we tried to reassure people that we we were not going to run out, but at the same time, I co totally can you know relate to that. And so we were fine with it, um, and we gave discounts and everything for for people who did that. So I think it was fine. But I think I think as we go forward, the supply chain will get more regular. That scarcity thing will go away to some degree. Um, but I don't think that the self awareness and the focus on health and immunity, getting fit, staying fit, and how that's so important, not just for, you know, how you look on the outside, but actually how well you can basically resist, um, you know, things like infection and disease. Yeah, 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 absolutely, big. Um, and it, talking about su supply chains with you, did you, I mean, we're kind of, like you said, March the 3rd, I think you said, like when your, when your staff started going remote, you think, geez, four, month, four months, a third of the year, into it um how has that affected your supply chain like personally with the businesses so when we set up um the nourish business we actually were building the supply chain around um business continuance for brexit so you know how many times yeah. has brexit been delayed like when we were originally mm. setting it up brexit was like ever present and coming fast and so when we actually did it we set up the supply chain with the goal of getting as much as possible, 90% plus of our supply from the UK market. And so that's what we actually did because I didn't want to be dependent on European supply and then have yeah. the order, which nice. is, is about to happen now in the next six months and mm -hmm. be in a really, really bad situation. And so having, I think 98% of our supply chain, including like packaging, um, you know, things like raw materials, um, all of that is coming from the UK. And then we have a couple suppliers from the United States and India, but these, we are forward buying products so much that we haven't had a major issue. Don't get me wrong. We have a meeting about it every Friday where we have actually like touch points with the individual suppliers to make sure they don't see an issue coming. We shouldn't be forward buying, but at the mm -hmm. same time with our business, we have, you know, we don't make anything until somebody orders it. Right. So we don't yeah. have, stock sitting there going out of date. And so it allows us to be a lot better in the way that we plan and the way that we forecast, which has really served us well. Mm. And you can remind me if I'm wrong, but you, you can pretty much produce 24 hours a day as often as you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right now they're working on a second, they're working two shifts to, right now um, with the added capacity from the new machines. It's really fantastic. But if we hit the targets we're supposed to at the end of this month, then they will go to a triple shift, um, yeah. which is which is nor like it's not normal. You wouldn't want to run it 24 um, 7, uh, 365, but yeah. it is normal in seasonality of different products to see a factory go into a triple shift program for certain times of the year. And mm -hmm. luckily, the team are very much aware of it and very used to it. So I think it should be OK. Nice. Um, and we talked briefly before about new product development. Uh, maybe you can share that uh, with everybody to, to catch up on, on your story. Um, I, I'm assuming it, it hasn't stopped new product development like the last four months, or has it accelerated some things? Have you kind of repositioned pieces? Yeah. So basically, originally, my plan was that we were going to launch the US market this year. And so basically because of the crisis and the implications that the crisis has on freedom of movement of people, it's simply not possible for us to go to America and open a factory and launch a business in the U.S. with an operational capacity. Mm. So what it did was it shifted our focus. So, okay, we can't do that right now, but we can definitely do it soon. And what we should do instead is focus on what we can offer our current core market, the U.K., um, in order to help give more people what they're asking for. And so we asked, I think, two and a half thousand people um, that were already current purchasers of the product. This was about three and a half months ago. What do you want us to make? Like, this is the options we are, we can do next. What do you want from us to make? So, um, and they all said, it was like overwhelming. I think it was 79% said Nourish Kids. So really? We're, we're, that many? Wow. Yeah. It tells you a lot about your audience, doesn't it? That's really it interesting data. Yeah. <laughs> It does. So Nourish Kids is going to be the first ever truly personalized children's um, 
vitamin and it will also be sugar free and vegan and 100% natural. Um, we're going to make them in a different way than we do nourish where they, they're going to be like little mini bags of product with little miniature product inside so that they can okay. bring as a snack for after lunch and they're free from allergens. So they're school safe and they're, they're going to be able to bring them in as like a snack for after they have their, their lunchtime meal. Mm, exciting. It is. It is. The flavors are the most fun for kids because kids are really adventurous and flavor is super important. So like yesterday we were doing a massive taste test and I was doing sour watermelon, fizzy cola, oh, yes. pineapple, <laughs> raspberry. you know, it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, but especially given, given your background, uh, as we, we, we mentioned before with, with catches and uh, with the Percy Pigs and, and all the rest of it. So um, you, you must have been through that a few times before in the past, checking out, you know, flavor sampling and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, flavoring is super important and people underestimate how important it is. Um, you know, there's actual flavors that are the I, the single IP of businesses. If you think Coca-Cola's flavor mm. is IP and they've never patented it, it's a secret it, and nobody yeah. has ever been able to figure it out, right? A lot of people have tried to copy it. Virgin Coda included, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? And then you think about like more local ones like Bimto, that is a secret mm. recipe. The flavor is literally the selling point of the product. And so when we look at flavoring in house, we really want it to be an experience. And we have some very cool technology, which basically uses multiple facets on the tongue to take the user through a multi-taste journey when they go through biting through the product. So mm -hmm. it will start with one flavor, then go to you know a, a secondary mouthfeel like fizzy or sour, then a third fruit flavor, you know, and so actually it's it's even funner when for kids because kids notice things like that even more mm -hmm. than um, but yeah, I think the nourish concept itself has 30 individual flavors, all that have to work together in any possible combination of seven. And this is a feat of flavoring in its own right. So the kids one is a little bit easier, if I'm honest. <laughs> right, that's amazing. So, yeah. I mean, your, your business is clearly um, reliant on, on tech. Uh, what would you say like the last three or four months then uh, that, that you've kind of taken away? Have you, have you, have you embraced any, any new technology? Have you kind of fallen back on tried and trusted technology because I'm sure you've been using a lot of this stuff anyway given that the amount you travel and you know how you operate anyway yeah so our business um has been paper free since the day I set it up so we don't even have a filing cabinet in my office um like, everything is on the cloud we have a you know a secure dropbox and an azure server etc that we use for all of our data storing and sharing and collaborative work on documents so that's served us quite well um we have i know everybody went mental for zoom we sure. actually switched from Zoom to Teams. I think Teams is so much nicer than Zoom, actually. And I know Zoom Zoom is a good option. I think if you don't have the Microsoft subscription, I'm sure Zoom is a fine option. But we just found Teams was so much nicer also for chat. It's kind of like m amalgamating the Slack concept with Zoom, with your sure. normal email functionality. And I, I think that Microsoft did a great job with that. And it works mm -hmm. really, really well. So we're using that a lot. Um, and then I'm trying to think what else we use, you know, we use tons of tech. We have about 17 things in our tax deck for our e-com. And then we have a fully integrated ERP and accounting server. So we have dashboards everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you log on to any one of my little stars on my Wi-Fi, and it will show me different dashboards of performance in real time across the business. Right. Luckily we set that up before COVID. Um, mm. And it's certainly not um, simple. It was complex, but now that it's running, it's served, the, it's paid itself back the investment um, tenfold already, and we're only what like eight months old. So it was a mm. good, it was a good idea. Yeah, very good. And are you thinking just to kind of finish up last couple of questions for you? Um, so you're in Birmingham at the moment, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when are you planning on? disappearing from Birmingham for a little bit because I know you do a hell of a lot of travel um, <laughs> during the course of a year normally. Yes, I would. I actually miss traveling if I'm honest. I didn't, I definitely yeah. traveled too much before, but I, I'm missing it now. I do enjoy seeing new cultures and 
I do enjoy moving around. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So I'm excited to get back out there. I think it will probably be at the end of this month and the beginning of August, we'll start to do some European trips um, and get back out. But even I think the team have just organized a field trip to London. <laughs> which is exciting um but even that will be really interesting to go down to the capital again and i used to be there two days a week um mm, yeah, yeah. and i feel I've, I've been for a long time so i'm looking forward to it i think it's you know it's going to be it will get better and better as time goes on and i think that's the attitude you have to take and, and just protect with you know we we made nourish face masks for everyone so we're giving nice. them away yeah. and, and they're great and they, and they actually make you feel yeah secure in yourself but also you're doing your duty for your fellow man right mm. yeah my one of my best friends he just came back from milan on what was it monday i think he went on friday for a meeting with a potential investor and he just said it's such a, a culture shock compared to this country he said literally everybody has a mask on you know 24 hours a day you know literally yeah. Um, and he said he came back to this country and he was like, Jesus, we're, you know, we're well behind what they're doing. And obviously that was where it was first reported in, in Europe, COVID. But since then, we've had that announcement that, uh, you know, masks to be worn in all shops from, from next week, et cetera. Um, yeah. So just, just to finish up then, I mean, lot, lots of uh, exciting developments happening and, you know, performance sounds like it's gone really well for you. you you're recruiting again. Um, any any tips on um, on investment for, for people looking uh, who've you know I think I read something like two hundred thousand new businesses have been started during the last four months in the, That's in the so UK good. with with Manchester and Liverpool being like the two hotbeds apparently which uh, which is interesting as well uh, yeah it was Oliver Cookson from My Protein who I just um, had on my podcast was, was telling me about that uh, which which was an interesting one. Um, but yeah, how do, how do you feel um, for, for anybody looking to um, to get investment at the moment? At the end of the day, surely it's the same amount of money as out there. It's just trying to access that money. And you, you've done it a few times. And any tips for those who have started businesses uh, during the last four months where you kind of look for, for potential investment routes? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two points. One is there is a certain amount of money still there and there's a healthy amount of money still there. So that's the first point. But the second point is a lot of funds, depending on how their current portfolio stands, have had to reinvest in their current portfolio companies in an unplanned way to mm. keep them alive. So yeah. it's a really good idea to use something like PitchBook or Crunchbase to investigate which it, um, kind of VCs that you like, the look of, that you think will be strategic for you, if they have large investments in businesses that are focused in an industry which has been heavily negatively affected by COVID. Because the chances of them having to deploy funds from, you know, capital from their fund into that business to keep it going through the crisis and triage it um, is higher than the normal. So I would definitely mm -hmm. look at that. The other thing I would say is um, Seed Legals is a really good um, website, which where you can also get very, very decent priced and or free legal advice around setting up and funding and how to structure your term sheets. Um, but also if you sign up to their um, mailing list, you get a list of different events where you can go and meet now digitally investors from different aspects and different okay. they also teach you how to do things such as you know how to pitch an investor how to build your teaser deck and all that stuff so if you're starting from mm -hmm. zero definitely look at that because it's quite useful and they are very unbiased in the way they give the information um but then the last thing i would do is probably look at things like um you know which investors are out there in the media right now so the business press and financial times or any business section of a black and white talking about investment because the chances of them being high in appetite for investment is much higher yeah 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 um brilliant that's really really helpful i think um it's interesting like during the last couple of months i've noticed a lot of the uh, audience we've got on um festival of enterprise have been people you know in in the early stages who've been inspired to start a business or started a second or a third business even i've seen quite a few quite a few examples of that so um that's super helpful as always easiest uh, way to get hold of you is literally going to be get dash nourish.com am i correct yes that's right and if anybody has questions they can just reach out to the info or the contact page 
Um, and then, yeah, I still get those emails. So um, go ahead and send them through. And um, specific funding questions, happy to help people um, if they have a specific business that they need funding for. Um, each business is different. So it's really hard to give general advice about that. So happy yeah. to help if I can um, to give anybody more direction around a specific need. There we go. I've just posted up the website there as well. We'll follow up with everybody. Um, who registered for this obviously mo more people watch it on the on the replay and then we'll be putting it out on the podcast as well so the most common question i get asked is when's a replay going to be available and it will literally be available in about 15 seconds uh as soon as i <laughs> sign up with melissa so you can all watch it at your leisure then um but yeah really thank you for taking 30 40 minutes out of your busy day um sounds like things are going really really well um so thank you very much indeed melissa and hopefully catch up soon Wonderful. Thanks so much, Alex. Have a nice day. See you.